All right, welcome everybody to March. It's March 2nd, uh, the Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Um, as most of us are aware, I think we've been on this call before, but uh, for those of you who are new, uh, we have two things that we must abide by. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. For announcements today, we have uh, two announcements that we've heard in the past few meetings. Uh, the first one is the Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter it goes out each Friday. If you have something that you would like to include in that newsletter, please leave a comment uh, for consideration on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. And the second one is the Hyperledger Mentorship Program has uh, started. There is a call for project proposals and that uh, call goes until March 15th, so just under two weeks that you have to submit your project proposals if you are interested in being a mentor. Uh, I did take a look at that. There are five out there um, that look really interesting, so uh, looking forward to seeing more uh, show up. Any other announcements that anybody has or would like to make? Okay, there's no other announcements. Uh, then we did have uh, the quarterly reports here. So Lane did come in uh, by the time I had created the agenda. We have also since received Ursa and Cello um, that have come in. The Bevel one is still out there. I think there's a couple of people who have yet to review that one. Um, please do take a look. I didn't see any questions except for the one that I have on Ursa, which is. Um, that the Ursa report for Q1 actually comes out in is supposed to be due in like two weeks. Um, and I think this happened the last go around too, is we had um, the quarterly report for Ursa come in like just before the, the Q4 one was due. And, and so we we had some bit of confusion there. And so I'm wondering if we should make the, the current report, the Q1 report, and um, just assume that the Q4 report doesn't happen or in some ways, what should we do here? Um, so Stephen, I see you have your hand up. On a separate topic, so um, I don't really have an opinion. I, I mean, I think it would be, it makes sense that that it be the, um, whatever it is, 2023 Q1 report, I, I would say, but hand up for a different reason after. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks Stephen. Uh, we'll get to you in a moment. Does anybody else have any thoughts on the URSA report and what we should do about Q1 versus Q4? Or no? So I, I agree with you. I think might as well skip it. The only problem is they shouldn't become a habit that the groups can just skip on. Completely agree, Arno. All right, there, um, so, there, yeah, Peter? There was a comment, though, oh. that uh, they had changed some of their uh, committers. Yeah, I did see that too, right? So, I'm um, wondering if maybe we could get them to add the Q1 information to it. Um, unfortunately, I didn't see a, an answer from the submitter on what they were planning to do for Q1, so um, maybe, Maybe we'll take that back to the, the discussion thread and see if we can get some sort of closure on that. Yeah, Peter? Good idea. Uh, I would leave some sort of trace of it that it was skipped. And then other than that, it, I would just skip it too. So that, would, that should maybe hopefully deter a habit forming where with projects just skip it because it's actually pretty easy to skip it and there's no any sort of consequence. Of course, us just writing down, oh, this has been skipped is not really a severe consequence, but the, I, I also guess it would be the only one severe consequence either, or at least not a person. Okay, makes sense, Peter. 
So we will um, take that then back to the submitter of the report and see if we can maybe maybe get the the Q1 report to to come out since it is does have some differences like uh, Rai mentioned um, and uh, see if we can see what we can do there. But yeah, I. I I think Arno and Peter, you're both correct. We don't want people skipping their quarterly reports. Those are um, useful and they do tell us that things are happening or not happening as the case may be. All right, so Stephen, your topic. Yes, um, I may have missed this in, in when I started to prepare quarterly reports, but um, what is the uh, time frame that you're supposed to use for a quarterly report? Um, like the, for, for instance, for releases and for the LFX insights, I've always done it that it is the calendar quarter previous to when I'm reporting. So I would do like when I did one this February, I think it was, I did from September to December as the time range and made sure that I was only talking about things that happened during the, that quarter. Um, I noticed in the reports today that I was looking through it, the period was November, end of November to end of February. So they're, uh, because, you know, basically they're putting it out at the end of February, they go right up to the point of release. So is there a, a guidance on this? Um, I just like to be consistent with what others are doing and what, what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we really have any guidance uh, that we've given to projects. Um, for me, I think consistency is key. Like right? consistency when within those reports for the project. Um, okay. So for you, if you're always reporting the the quarter, right, the calendar quarter, um, then you will always cover all of the information and you won't skip anything, right? Um, say from the beginning of January to when you report it. Um, right because you, you will have reported that yeah, obviously in the Q2 um, report, right? So you're, you're reporting on Q1 during the Q2 report. Um, there are others who basically do from the last time they submit it, right? So that they're consistent in as far as not missing any time between when they submitted the, the previous report and when they're submitting this report. I don't like, like I said, I don't know that it matters as long as we're not missing any sort of information um that exists there uh, arno has his hand up so maybe has a different thought there no i i just want to uh, I, this question has been raised before and i always tell people you can choose either one of those uh, you know ways that you just talked about uh, tracy i think the problem with fixing saying this is the actual quarter is that because projects don't always all report at the same time if you end up, you know, being towards the end of the quarter, reporting on the quarter before is already quite far away. And I remember doing this for Fabric at some point, and it feels like, well, I should report on the last, uh, you know, three months rather than the qu the actual quarter before. And so, for that reason, I felt like, you know, the last three months, whatever that is for you at the time you do your report. Uh, I think works better. And as Tracy says, if you just keep doing this anyway, then you're consistently doing the same thing. You won't have gaps and that's what matters. Yeah, thanks, Arno. Right. I have a terrible idea that I'll make as a suggestion. And that's just that we go, you know, we basically use fiscal years, right? And everyone reports on the same day. So all of the reports will be due on the first day of the quarter. Um, that would give clarity. And if you're a manager of multiple projects, you would just have to get into insights one time a quarter and get all your reports done. But I don't file these reports. So there might be people that have other ideas. I see a couple of thumbs up. So I, I see the floor to heart. Yeah, I think the biggest issue with that rise, is not the people filing the reports, but the people reading the reports. <laughs> Um, I don't think we would get very good quality reviews if we had all the projects reporting on the same day. Either people would have to do a ton of work or they would just mail it in. Uh, no comment. Yeah, uh, Alexander. Yes, um, just as a suggestion, um, it might not be that. So 
there could be middle ground between detaching from the fiscal year entirely and between reviewing everything on the same day. Um, what we could do is we could just do a randomized assignment and project report on certain days after the fiscal year begins, but it's a fixed date and it's assigned externally. Um, also, what could be done is that they have to be reported on the same day. Um, and as Hart pointed out, the people reviewing them are given a regular schedule to review the, the basically the reports are reviewed, but not all at the same time, but in sequence, and that sequence is determined. Allocate a certain amount of time, how much it takes today, um, double that, and we have a good estimate. Yeah, so I think your first option is what we're doing today, right, where everybody is given uh, a certain time uh, in Q1 to report, right, their Q1 reports, whatever that is, the, the project calendar um, that exists. And then your second option, um, the, I guess the concern that I have, and, and I'm not sure if, if it's a big concern, but um, if we get everybody to report, say, on January 2nd, <laughs> right, um, so, so they can recover from the new year, um, then we have, you know, this sort of schedule that being shown on the screen here, where the TOC reviews on, you know, a weekly basis, somebody reports. I think the challenge might be that if there are questions or concerns, getting the, the submitter to respond to those questions or concerns, you know, say a, a month later, right? Um, I think that's the, the biggest challenge that exists there. But yeah, I, I don't know. This is, this is what we do today. And uh, I think the, you know, back to Stephen's point, it's really just up to the project as to whether or not it makes sense to report for the previous quarter or for the 90 days since they last reported. So I built this calendar based on something that Tracy had done. And as this calendar has evolved over the years, I have tried to make sure that projects that share maintainers become more and more aligned like Aries Indy, you know, Grid and Transact. I've kept Fabric and Sawtooth where they were since they were the first two projects to kind of get the ball rolling. So they're still kind of at the top, but I've tried to spread this out. So over the quarters that these line up and they help us avoid at the end of the year, it's easier since we have so many holidays to avoid having everything come due at once. I'm not married to any of this. If anyone has a, a better or fair way to do this, <laughs> let me know. Let us know. I'm totally game to change this up for 2024. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for bringing up this. I think this helps people to kind of see that there is a consistent schedule for uh, each of the projects. It's just not consistent across all projects, like uh, meaning everybody reports on the same day. Other thoughts or comments about this? Even did we answer your question or cause more confusion? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to take us down a rabbit hole. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Thank you for the question. All right. So if we then go back to the agenda, um, I guess the, the question that I have is are there any other questions on the reports that we should talk about? Um, before we move on. Marcus. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I actually kind of like the idea of having this fixed schedule. Um, I mean, my personal preference would be, I mean, not spreading it over three months, essentially. Um, I mean, that of, as Hart mentioned, this will, would introduce more work on the reviewers. But um, on the other hand, I mean, reading uh, uh, or reviewing a report which is 
um, I mean, three months old already. I mean, this is also uh, smells a little bit like old cheese. <laughs> um, and, but anyway, so I, I would keep uh, the system as we have, but I think it's also more uh, importantly um, that the reports itself that they are consistent. So what, what I actually do not like by uh, when I reviewed um, the reports we had so far is that some reviews basically report um, for for the actual quarter, um, and some of, some others were actually reporting um, from the beginning of the quarter until they uh, until the actual report submission uh, was done. Because I mean, if that will happen for a project which uh, submits in the end of the current quarter for the last quarter, then uh, this report will almost spend half a year, I guess, right? Yes, yeah, this is just my comment. Yeah, thank you for that, Stephen. Okay, now I'm gonna, having thought about it a bit more. Um, I, I agree with Marcus, I think, and, and I find as a writer, um, it's kind of painful to um, have to figure out, okay, let's ignore things like I had comments in my last one since Timo knows about our project you know why didn't I mention this release and this release and that was because it happened after December 31st um, I, I would say to to deal with both of those things that a, a report get I, I think the distribution of when they're due is appropriate I think we should make it that the report should cover um, the three-month period before and any reports that have been, any projects that have been reporting differently should just fill the gap with an extra note in their next report. Um, but from then on, should be consistently reporting right up to the day that they submit. And, and basically, that is just to make it easier to both write and read. So you know it's always, this is the latest of what's happening up to the moment. That would be my suggestion. Okay, um, so obviously the ones that you've been submitting, Stephen, are that way. Um, I guess we would have to find out if there are other ones um, that report similarly to you. Um, so I guess we'll have to go through the list and see, and then maybe let them know that that is uh, what would be preferred. Yeah. Yes, Stephen. And, and then one other is maybe we make them do I notice, you know, do 2nd of March, do 9th of March, would it make more sense to have them do at least on a month basis so that they're third? But that I actually, never mind. I think that gets complicated and it comes back to the, you have to review too many reports at once. All right, scratch what Stephen just said. Uh, yeah. Run yep. your memories. All right, uh, any questions on the reports as they were submitted? Uh, at this point, though. All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, so I guess two things. Uh, first, uh, I didn't have any specific TOC topics to discuss, only task force topics to discuss today. Um, but does anybody have any other topics that they think is worthwhile to bring up to the TOC today and, and discuss? Arun? Thanks, Tracy. So I think I wanted to bring up the topic of project health reports. And I know Jim was working on it last year. And we had elaborate discussion on the GitHub uh, issue itself or the GitHub PR itself. And I wish that uh, we bring that again, we bring it up again. And Jim, I'm not sure you have availability, but I think we have so many good points over there in the chat. And it, it's worthwhile for us to consider those points and bring them up. Uh, and, uh, Arun, just, just FYI, Jim is not on the call today. Um, um, so we won't be able to probably have conversations with Jim about that. Um, I did also see your message about the task force discussion, um, that you don't have a computer and, um, are looking to see if we can switch out which task force we talk about today. 
Um, before we do that, though, any other topics that anybody would like to discuss on the TOC level that's not task force related? All right, uh, so that would be a no. Um, so I think we have two options here. Um, one is that we uh, can talk about security vulnerability disclosure without Arun having uh, a laptop. Um, the second option is last week, Dave, Dave, I'm putting you on the spot. So if you're not ready, just say you're not ready. But last week you had asked if we could continue the discussion this week um of the task force that we were going through last week uh so what preference do we have for uh task force discussion today would we like to try to talk about security vulnerability disclosures um without arun having access to his laptop I personally would prefer, while things are still somewhat fresh in mind, that uh, you know Dave carries on with the conversation we were having last week. But personal preference. Um, I will say, Tracy, as well, that I have been working on some vulnerability disclosure stuff that is sort of half baked, and maybe it would be better to talk about that in a later week and let Dave take over this week. Hey, Dave, everybody's putting you on the spot. Are you ready, willing, able? All right, I guess Dave can do that. <laughs> do you want to share your screen or do you want me to? Yeah, talk? I'm just trying to pull it up here. I think I got it. All right. Okay, if I recall, we got maybe halfway through the community section. I forget exactly where we left off. I think we got through the public meetings. Uh, next topics were going to be meetups and workshops. So I didn't have much initial guidance here other than they're a good idea. But if anybody has um, thoughts on what a good practice would be for meetups and workshops, we can add that here. Um, so I guess question David Boswell, um, do we have any documentation or anything on the wiki that would help with people who are looking to put together workshops or meetups that we could point to? There is the meetup organizer guide. Um, we don't have a workshop organizer guide. But that's probably a good idea to do it. Um, and ironically, and I apologize about this, but I'd need to jump to help get a uh, uh, meetup going in about five minutes. We're live streaming something, a meetup from MWC in Barcelona. So I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna miss some of this conversation. But yeah, I, I think meetup and workshops are a great idea and we do definitely want to support and encourage them. I think the ones we've done have demonstrated that they bring you know, new users, new contributors into projects and the projects that do them seem this tying into the project health, you know, discussion. I think the projects that do actively do meetups and workshops, you know, tend to have indicators of health that, you know, we don't necessarily see in the projects that don't do those things. So I am fully supportive of this as a best practice. And I, again, I apologize. I'm gonna have to drop in four minutes for part of this discussion, but there is the meetup organizer guide. We don't have a workshop organizer guide is the short answer. Okay, we'll add the link to the meetup organizer guide. And the room has a sound up. And we do, sorry, one more thing that just occurred to me. We do have a bi-weekly meetup and workshop planning call. Maybe we can link to that as well. That's, I, I can drop both of those links on Discord. Yeah, I put the link, David, for the uh, wiki page in the Discord where all the meetup stuff is and the workshop yeah. stuff. Great, 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 thanks.
Okay, uh, maybe down to pull requests, and there might be some more good ideas around pull requests. But I um, just put the obvious. Oh, is there another comment sorry. here? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It, um, are we going to have to sign up? I don't know if it's to talk about meetups or workshops. Right. I think one challenge that I've seen people facing with that aspect is um, the, some of the maintenance have been reaching out, or some of the people have been reaching out. They don't know who to reach out to in order for them to organize the meetups. And they're willing to speak or they're willing to give a workshop. They just need to find out people. And I believe that has caused uh, some delays or like they don't know who to talk to or who to reach out to. It would be worthwhile if we can have a mailing list where people can send an email saying that I'm interested in conducting this meetup or I would need to talk on this topic. Um, and that way it connects to all the meetup organizers and they can respond back over there. I'm sure that yeah. collaboration. And there is there is a meetup organizer mailing list. There's also a meetup alias. So if people have questions, those go the meetup alias goes to me and the meetup organizer mailing list goes to all the organizers. Awesome. Let's add that information here. Thanks. Bobby. Yeah, I just want to say, like, I've worked with David um, running a meetup in um, my area, and there is a lot of resources out there. One of the things that, um, like, a little history that has changed a little bit, uh, the meetups before COVID, obviously, were very uh, geographically secluded. Um, and then once COVID happened, um, David opened it up so that if uh, one group puts a meetup out there, it's broadcast to um, everyone. And I think right now with the meetups, we're on the fence about uh, going back in person because that seems to have so much more richness to the meetup and brings so much more. So we're trying to figure out like a hybrid broadcasting them on YouTube, but still encouraging people to meet in person. Um, and that's basically the meetups. And I know with the workshops, the history of that was whoever wanted to do a workshop, put it out there, usually came out of something from the global forums. And I know now John Carpenter and uh, Jim Sullivan, who have taken over the learning materials working group, they're really focused on doing hands-on workshops. And Jim has put a couple out there that are fabulous. So if anybody has any ideas for workshops, like if your project isn't getting enough uh new people coming in, you might want to hook up with John Carpenter and figure out a network meetup that will, or network workshop that will get everyone involved um, and target the, because they're attended um, fabulously, these workshops. People really want hands-on uh, short courses that can get them up and running on all of the different projects of their flavor. So um, just to catch up on those two um, items. Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. Anything else for meetups and workshops? Okay, so where I was going with pull requests, I was just stating I had the obvious thing here about quick turnarounds. They are appreciated and encourage future contributions. I think, of course, for new contributors, especially, it's good to be welcoming and positive, but I covered that in the first bullet here. Peter? Yeah, and you can see what that is in Insights. Oh, sorry, Peter. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say I did have uh, not just a quick review turnarounds, Point, but also the other point, which we have written down in some other document, I'm just not sure exactly there, but point being, if you put an extra sentence there, maybe that says, says uh, try to review the pull requests in the order they come in instead of based on which one you like better. I think it was something like equal attention to pull requests. Okay, sounds good. Rama. 
Yeah, I think uh, just on the uh, on how to prioritize pull requests, probably uh, when the uh, if the pull requests are addressing one of the issues that's uh, there in the the GitHub, then I think you should probably address it rather than just some random pull request that somebody submitted. So uh, because it's solving a problem that uh, I think the project uh, maintainers want to be solved. So. What do you think, Peter? I mean, I, I think it kind of goes on set. I think the maintainers use good judgment. Um, if there's something that's really important and hot, I think maintainers usually will prioritize that. But as a general rule of thumb, it's good to have equal attention to PRs. I think that's, I think that's fine. Yeah, I'm also guilty of having merged pull requests out of order. And actually, I, I did that just a couple of days ago because we had to build broken and it was important to get it back on track. So I'm very on board with also adding some additional little clarification in there that says uh, to use on the best effort basis, use best judgment as necessary, something like that. Hey, yeah, so I've been someone who's really been encouraging this. Um, and, you know, I don't think it has to be a hard and fast rule, like, right, obviously, if you have a, a critical, um, you know, a critical security review or something, or, or you know, it, that can get jumped to the front. Um, the point here is that sometimes there is perception that, you know, people review, like, their friends' PRs before, uh, before PRs from community members they don't know. Um, and, you know, the idea is that with some adjustments for priority of the PR, there should be, you know, it, it should be FIFO generally, right? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm actually really curious to hear what other people like, like Peter, you know, had some, just now had some good comments about this. Um, you know, I'm curious to hear what other people think about might be, you know, good ways to, to practically implement this. So thanks. All right, so I've said equal attention to PRs, review and order of arrival as a general rule of thumb. So it's not a rule written in stone, but something to strive for. In terms of practical ways to implement this, I can't think of any. Yeah, I also, I don't, I don't propose that we implement some sort of enforcement on this. Uh, just to at least mention it, because uh, from what I can tell, a lot of people might not necessarily even think about it. It's just uh, sort of an unconscious bias that just creeps in sometimes. I think including that in um, in the maintainer's guidance. Um, which I have started to work on, by the way. I think I took that on as a task last week. So I've started to work on that. And I think just putting that in there, noting that in the quarterly reports, part of the insights and part of the metrics we look at are, you know, processing times on PRs, processing times on issues. I think that is just not hard and fast guidance, thou shalt do this, but rather, you know, these are things that are important to the you know the the health of a of a project in a repository, and therefore, um, you know, nudge nudge. You should pay attention to that when you're a maintainer. That's one of your responsibilities. I think that's the best we can do on that, and I think we could include issues in in, in that as well. And the other thing I noted that is a big problem in our projects recently is um, the maintainers looking at them and, and thinking and what they need to do with it, but not actually sending feedback to 
the community and particularly the contributor to say, oh, by the way, I'm looking at this. It, it is in, in my mind, but we've got to do this and this before we can merge that. <laughs> and um, I find that when I realize that's what's been happening, it's kind of frustrating. Um, but again, guidance to the, the maintainers to help them, you know, uh, to get that communication going, the need for that communication. Over communicate, good call. Yeah, I'll jump in here. I think over communication is a, a great, great approach. Like one of the things that I think good project, you know, really healthy projects do is that when like a review is going to be slow, uh, you know, maintainers will will tag it and say like, hey, you know, I saw your PR. I'm a little swamped right now. You know, I will get to this in approximately, you know, X time, right? Um, and that way, you know, people know that they're just not being outright ignored. They just, you know, they saw the, you know, if you're a maintainer, you've told them that, you know, this is going to be slow, uh, but, you, you know, you're not intentionally forgetting them. Uh, you, you're just super busy and you'll get to it when, you know, when you can and, and hopefully when you tell them. So I really think this is a good idea. Um, like, you know, uh, if, if people are waiting on you, like comment and tell them that you've seen it and you're going to address it, you just can't right now. This makes people feel so much better rather than just a black hole. Yeah, I think that's really good su suggestions here. Anything else on pull requests? Alexander. Um, just an observation from our side. Um, we often have very stringent coding guidelines and um, we often found that we need to relax them for community contributors. Rust is a very popular language and um, fewer people still are capable of producing it to the level that we require. Um, so what we found is sometimes it's better to just give very, very gentle guidance and then fix up after it's merged. That's a good point. I'm trying to think how to word that here. Be gentle on new contributors. Perhaps relax coding guidelines and fix up later. Okay. Okay, anything else on pull requests? Okay, let's go on to contributing docs. So uh, I put several of what I thought were good references here of, of contributing docs that projects already had. They're in a smattering of different places between the wiki and GitHub and read the docs. So we might want to standardize on that. Uh, I guess that kind of goes to the whole doc work group, which we will talk about in a later session. Um, but the other thing that struck me is a lot of the content in here was repeated across the projects. So one idea I thought is maybe perhaps we take a look at this and we try to pull out some of the content that is similar across the projects and put that kind of in a um, central place so it doesn't have to be reinvented and, re and redocumented for each project. They can just reference kind of the, the basic guidance around contributing to Hyperledger projects and then, of course, each project might have additional considerations they'd want to document on their own. Um, but if, you, if anybody has a project, I think they 
think I've missed in terms of a good reference, you know, we can add it here as well. But I'll open it up for other thoughts. Okay, I'll just say I think having a consistent template of things that should be included in the contributing guide is extremely worthwhile, um, which I think is it's to your note there. Um, but you know, obviously each project might have slightly different requirements for contributing uh, that they would want to put in, into place. But I do think that, you know, these if we have something that says these are the things that you must include in your contributing guide. Uh, I think that becomes very useful. Okay, anything else? All right, if we take a step back, is there any other guidance around community in general that we should be mentioning to maintainers and new maintainers? Peter? I don't know if uh, this is still on topic or not, but within the contributing MD, if we have a template, I would uh, suggest to be very sure and thorough of that template including some guides and tutorials or basic good stuff. Because that's what new engineers struggle with 95% of the time on poor requests that I've been doing. But I don't know if this is going to spiral out into a completely different conversation that then becomes off topic from this document. So we don't have to talk. I just wanted to mention it. I missed part of that, Peter, but I do have a comment later on when we get to documentation, just talk about the project developer guide, including coding guidelines, build instructions, test instructions. Is that kind of the area that you were targeting? Or are you talking about a tutorial in terms be, yeah. of usage? No, it definitely would be project uh, coding guidelines. That's closest to it, I guess. But yeah, we can discuss it in that scope. Okay, yeah, let's defer that to we get to that discussion. And maybe we'll talk about that also in the doc work group, the doc task force. Dave, in the, the community section, do we have anything in there about making making decisions publicly and communicating kind of those discussions online and, and mailing lists and that sort of thing. Um, I, I think that there are times when organizations can hold meetings privately and make decisions. And then people in the community are like, where did that come from? I, I don't know how we came to this conclusion that this was the right decision to make. Um, so I guess that's one that I was just going through uh, in that first link in the YouTube presentation. It's Swetha and I I'm doing a presentation on kind of good practices. And so I was kind of going through there and, and that was one that I didn't see included. How's that decision should be made in public or at least socialized in public? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, and then also going through that same uh, presentation, uh, under the pull request, one of the comments that we have here is like, do not waste the contributor's time. If you're not going to accept the PR, say that you're not going to accept the PR um, because it doesn't, you know, um, match up with the roadmap or that sort of thing, right? Like, don't, don't leave people hanging that they think it's going to be include it in the project, but in the end, there's no way it's going to be included because it goes completely off um, the direction of where the project's going. And, I, and then I think the other thing is like mentoring, 
is the other piece of this. And it could be mentoring on for new contributors when they come in and submit a PR, like helping them through that process is, is probably really important too. Uh, sorry, I missed the last one. I was typing while I was typing the first one. Uh, what was the yeah. second one again? Sorry, uh, it, it had to do with mentoring. Um, so mentoring uh, new contributors on kind of what that process is, like helping them through the the process. And and I think mentoring would even come outside of PRs, right? Like, but I think just the mentor aspect in general is important in the community. Okay. Oh, good feedback here. Anything else? All right, let's see. That might be a good place to end because we have the security section next and doc sections next. And I'd kind of like to have the next discussions in those. Um, task forces before we talk about what we put here this was kind of just going to be a summary uh, of some of some things if they don't catch all if, if maintainer doesn't uh, catch up on everything else that's going on in those other places at least the most important things I think we should mention here uh, but I guess what do you what do you all think should we at least start these sections I will say I thought this um, secure developer guide was really good from OpenSSF. So they cover a whole lot of things. Um, but it's not an overwhelming amount of things. So I think this is a very good reference uh, we should point people to. And in fact, most of my bullets here align with what's over there as well but I tried to call out in a concise way some of the most, what I thought were the most important things. So what do y'all think? Should we start this section or defer until after we talk about the security tax task force next time? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say we could try and start to discuss it and maybe they'll have a productive and short conversation in the time we have left, but maybe in the first two minutes we arrive at the conclusion, oh, okay, no, this is not going to be both. So I, I would say let's just start and see where it goes and if you feel like we should stop it, then stop it. Okay, so maybe what I'll ask, instead of just reading all these, uh, just take a minute to read through them and think at, again, this document was not meant to be all encompassing in terms of um, a comprehensive depth, um, but it's to highlight the most important things for new maintainers, especially. So maybe read through the list um, and then we'll get your feedback on, do we, do we think we've covered at least the most important things here? And then we could step through them if we want to. I got a thumbs up from Peter. Thumbs up from Alexander. All right, I'll give one more minute. Aaron, thumbs up. Rama, thumbs up. <laughs> Steven, thumbs up. All right, we have consensus on thumbs up. Bobby, thumbs up. Arno, thumbs up. Marcus. 
I think people think this looks like a fairly decent section, Dave. Okay, so if I'll ask first if I missed anything that's very important here. Peter? That might be already included in one of the link sites, but the first thing that came to my mind was to uh, did not use auto upgrade to always pin the dependency versions to specific ones so that uh, the auto upgrade supply top supply chain attacks don't work when uh, you know they overtake a dependencies project and they publish a new release that is actually malware and then you auto upgrade on to that by accident so that i think that goes along with this line so pin de dependencies and Keep up to date. Two exact versions. Yeah. yeah. So what should, what should we say about, should we say beware or so how do we summarize what you said here? Uh, well, as a sub point, you could say auto upgrade can lead to, can and have in the past led to uh malware being distributed in malicious uh new versions of previously secure software Okay, anything else important you think I've missed here? Not for me. I'm just wondering what it means to schedule a security audit for graduate project of major releases. I mean, I understand what it means, but I mean, how would, I mean, what kind of suggestion is that? Who, who should do that security audit? I mean, what do we recommend here? Yeah, this one was a little doubtful in my mind as well. I thought we'd have a discussion around that. So I know at one point, at least, we've talked about uh, Hyperledger doing this for um, graduated project major releases. I'm not sure if that's still valid guidance. Does anybody know off the top of your head? Hey, uh, that's actually a fantastic question. Um, we have traditionally done security audits in sort of an ad hoc way. Uh, as you all probably know, they are quite expensive. Uh, so we typically have to uh, ask the board to adjust budget based on the number of security audits that we are doing. Um, we have tried to do them for graduated projects around major releases. Uh, the plan has been to initially try to keep doing that, uh, but obviously any and all feedback is welcome. Uh, and just keep in mind that anything we come up with, we need to uh, run by the board on this uh, because there's a lot of uh, money involved and we may have to adjust the budget one way or another. Uh, did that answer your question, Marcus? Well, kind of. I mean, uh, I mean, this is super interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I was wondering as to how much is the budget for such a review? I mean, I, I was never exposed to something like that. Um, but I mean, as, as a guidance, I mean, you should, I mean, if the project maintenance, I mean, should they all agree? Okay, let's let's uh, let's go together and ask the board for for an audit. Or I mean, do we do we have uh, somewhere the rules for for a certain request already? Uh, there's no rules really. What's typically happened is the maintainers have suggested that they would like an audit, uh, and then uh, we as staff have usually asked the board to do it uh, and and recommended it. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess, uh, Rye can probably tell you the exact budget details for the security audits better than I can. Um, some of it does depend on, uh, the, 
you know, the code and the, the scope of the audit, but we would like to have a sort of more uh, deterministic uh, audit process, basically. So, yeah, right. right. And we're also looking for, uh, we want to find other vendors to get RFQs from. Um, I know that uh, Bezu has been underwhelmed by the quality of the audits that they got back. So help us out. If you know a firm, we'd love to talk to them. Yeah, and I think the audits have want, run, what, fifty to $100,000? Is that about right, Ray? Yep. Yeah, so they're not cheap. I see, I see. But I mean, if if a project got such an audit, I mean, do they uh, do we then put a batch on the project side? Hey, they passed the the security audit by X Y Z. We have a wiki detailing all the security audits that have been done, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, and there's not like uh, I mean, security audits are not usually pass fail, right? Um, they usually point out a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, in a good security audit, if a project's been doing well, there will usually be some relatively minor things they've found. Uh, you know, if a project has, has not been doing a good job with security, then, uh, um, then, you know, uh, then there might be major issues. Uh, but you know, it, it's not, it's not really a pass fail thing, right? It's just a it's more of we did this and we fixed the recommendations, right? Okay. And eventually, like we open them all up, uh, so we we you know we publish them and say you know after all the fixes are done, like this is what happened, this is what people found, um, and you know some things uh, there there can even be things that that aren't intentionally fixed, right? We've had some cases where like you know there have been performance and security trade-offs, right? Where like uh, security audit firms have complained that, you know, a particular interface gives people a lot of room to hang themselves, uh, but it turns out that that interface is critical to some, you know, performance in code or something like that. So yeah, it, it, it's a process. Mm. I see. So what we would like to move to is we would like to to schedule audits in some sort of more deterministic way rather than the maintainers and the staff just sort of being like okay time for an audit right um in the past it's been very uh very ad hoc i mean i um, think something like i don't know once a year basis or whatever time frame is is fine i mean would be good for the let's say for the major projects or for the graduated yeah. projects in general? Yeah, so our initial thinking on this was not too far off from that. It was like sort of like at a major release and no more than once per some time period, um, whether it's like a year or a year and a half or, or whatever. Yeah, right. I think on, on Fabric, I think we've had one for V1 and V2, and they were maybe three years apart, so it seemed like pretty good cadence. Yeah, maybe we want faster than that, but you know, the some some cadence. I mean, these things take a while, right? They take on the order of months. Um, so if you do them too closely together, then you're sort of always security auditing. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's that's the general idea. Well, but I also get that the first audit on a project, I mean, is definitely more work than uh, a follow-up audit if they leverage uh, the magic of Git histories. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it depends on what the project does to a large degree. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. All right, folks, I'm gonna cut off this conversation because we are over time. Um, Dave, thank you so much for filling in today uh, and walking us through this. Um, Arun will expect to do the security task force next week. Uh, so let me know if that's not going to be the case and we can schedule Bobby in, uh, if needed. <laughs>